biogeochemist. She has been pioneering innovative designs for restoring the Everglades Ridge and Slough landscape for the last 28 years. She's a member of the graduate faculty of the University of Florida and of Florida Atlantic University. She is my go-to person for critical reviews and my sounding board for innovative science. Her dig talk is entitled, Resuscitate Resilience by Curbing Cattails. Sue. you know, cattail is now a prominent feature of the Everglades landscape. While native to this landscape, it was never present in the tens of thousands of hectares that you see today. So why is dense cattail a problem? Well, let's take a look. On the left, you can see an image of a typical ridge and slough landscape. You've got short stature sawgrass, and you're surrounded by an open water slough with that oatmeal white looking stuff, the periphyton. Now that landscape evolved because this system had low phosphorus concentrations and these plants were able to grow and sustain themselves under these conditions. However, over the last 40 years, surface water entering the Everglades has been enriched in phosphorus. And what that has allowed is a plant such as cattail, which grows very rapidly when fertilized, to take over that ridge and slough landscape and form what you see on the right. This dense cattail habitat has a dense canopy. You have very little light penetration, which means that the algae below are not producing oxygen. It is a habitat that is so dense that it is not able to be accessible by wildlife in many instances, such as wading birds. And it's not just the surfaces that have changed. If you look below, you can see that the soils are different too. On the left, you have soils created by the algae growing in the water column. You can see the marl, the mineral nature of those soils, and the flocky periphyton sitting on the top. On the right, you can see the highly organic, but fluffy flocculent material on the top of that soil core, created by the cattail that grows in it. So if we're to restore the ridge and slough landscape of the Everglades, we have to do something about these dense cattail stands. Well, when you think about vegetation management, the typical response is one of burning. Now, in the case of cattail, this is a short-term response. You don't get long-term desirable results because within two months of the burning on the left, you see the luxuriant cattail regrowth on the right. Under phosphorus-enriched conditions, cattail is very resilient. So what can we do? Well, some have said, well, let's do nothing. We know cattail's just the symptom. The problem is actually phosphorus. We have put tremendous effort in reducing phosphorus entering the landscape, so let's just wait. Let the system recover by itself. Well, looking at the graph on the left, what you can see is, well, actually, that's not the best solution. Here we're looking at the phosphorus concentration at sites downstream from an inflow structure, and each bar on the graph represents a year from 1996 to 2016. And what you can see is while the flock concentration of phosphorus goes up and down, there's no consistent decline. And this is despite the fact we've seen significant reductions in phosphorus concentrations and loads entering this ecosystem. But perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. We've just talked about the fact that the soils are created by the plants that grow in them. And on top of that, the roots then mine those soils, so there's a feedback. So if we can't burn, because there's not a long-term response, we can't do that alone. If we can't do nothing, then what can we do? Well, we need to be bolder. And that's why 14 years ago, my colleagues and I were accused of being sellouts. We were accused of being sellouts because we proposed that we should be able to herbicide the Everglades to control the cattail and improve conditions in the phosphorus-enriched environment. And back then, just like now, the use of herbicides is an issue of high publicity uh, quota in the press and also in the scientific literature. But why were we okay with that? Well, we had worked in the system for quite a while. 
We've worked in South Florida for a long time. We knew that we have an almost year-round growing season. We don't have that extensive winter die-off. We don't have that extensive cold, which kicks the system back. We had some decades of experience of working with cattail. We know that if you fertilize it, if you manipulate it with hydrology, if you burn it, ultimately what you've done is created an environment that is making it more prone to invasion by cattail, as opposed to one of more desirable natives. On top of that, as a graduate student, I took training and was tested as an aquatic applicator, AKA nozzle head. So I was very familiar with the pros and cons of using herbicides in different environments. So let's talk about, well, what did we do? Well, we decided that by using a combination of herbicides and fire, we could create openings in the dense cattail. And that if we could sustain them over the long term, then perhaps what we could do is create a system that functioned similarly to the native slough habitat. So as you can see on the image on the left, we created openings in enriched and moderately enriched areas of, the of area 2A, and we had adjacent controls. And within those habitats, we measured a whole bunch of parameters as shown on the right. Wading bird axis, fish, algae, soil nutrient concentrations, oxygen, a whole bunch of things. And we also measured those at unenriched conditions further downstream. So what did we see? Well, I'm going to take you through a series of photographs that on the left will always have the starting condition, an overview of the vegetation, which is sawgrass, dense cattail, and the bright green is willow. And on the right, we're going to look at changes over time. So the first thing we saw, we treated in 2006. By 2008, the plot was overwhelmed with a submerged aquatic vegetation primarily the macroalgae, cari, which you can see in this brown-green material. <laughs> a few years later, the plot appears to have developed green mumps. Those green mumps are actually the emergent macrophyte, Eleocris, also known as spycrush. And you can see the cara is still there below the surface water. But what you can't see when the plots are wet is what the cara is doing within the water column. And in the water column, it's photosynthesizing, and that in turn acts, interacts with the surface chemistry, and you end up creating these new sediments, calcium carbonate being deposited of a function of that interaction. But as you can see here, you still have those green Eleocris circles. Now, if we flood the plots, now you can see that those circles are actually expanding. And if you look closely at a ground view, the plot now looks almost like a wet prairie. Now, there is some seasonality in what these plots look like, and most recently, in December 2018, you can see that the Eleocris is more sparse, but you can see the presence of that car, or that macroalgae up front, the bright green and whitish material. Now, if we compare this habitat to the habitat where we started from, the cattail, there are many ecological benefits. We've increased the plant species and abundance of different communities. That, in turn, has increased the oxygen concentrations in the water column. Those two features combined has resulted in an increase of these habitat used by wildlife, particularly waterfowl, wading birds. We've seen increase in fish biomass. We've seen changes in the chemistry of those fish. And we've also seen changes in soil chemistry, bidirectional, I might add. These are huge ecological changes, directly attributable to the restoration activities we did in this project. So let's go through the last three in a little bit more detail. Comparing the cattail to our open created plots, you can see there's been a significant increase in wading bird use. And that's because these are accessible and the prey species are accessible. And one of those prey species that are accessible and more abundant is fish. In prior work, we've discussed the fact we see an increase in fish biomass and an increase in the nutrient content of those fish. What we haven't presented before, but that may be as equal significant, is the mercury content of those fish. Now, in the cattail areas, you have high phosphorus to moderate levels of phosphorus and high sulfur. But you have very low total mercury in the fish. And that is because in these areas, you have high sulfide. And that is inhibiting the formation of methyl mercury. And methyl mercury is the form that's necessarily taken up by fish. 
On the opposite end, in the unenriched slew, the low P moderate sulfur slew, you have a lot of mercury in the fish. And that's because you have ideal conditions for mercury methylation. But these areas are now also readily accessible to foraging wading boats. So an unexpected benefit of this project was the bar graph in the middle. In this plot, in our chip plots for Cattail Habitat Improvement Project, in their plots we found that we have got a 50% lower mercury content in the fish produced. And this is significant because we produce bigger and more fish in these open areas relative to the downstream sluice. Continuing on on this biogeochemical theme, let's move on to the third of the things we were looking at, and that is soil chemistry. This is a bit more of a paradox, because initially we made conditions worse. Here we're looking at the flock TP concentration, that flocky material at the sediment surface. The purple lines represent the cattail, and the green is the open plot. With the red arrow, you can see the very first thing we did is we increased phosphorus content of that material. And that's because we, by creating the opening, a lot of material was deposited on the sediment surface. That dead cattail that wasn't burnt was deposited on the sediment surface. And that resulted in an increase in phosphorus. But what we needed was time. Time to create new soils and time to bury the old ones. And what you can see over time is there's a significant decrease in phosphorus in our open plots. And for those of you familiar with phosphorus concentrations in Everglades soils, we're now approaching 500 milligrams per kilogram, which is similar to what you measure in low phosphorus peat soils of the northern system. So what do they look like? Well, here we have an image of the cattail on the left, our created open in the middle, and the low pea soils on the right. And what you can see is our soils are somewhat in the middle in terms of that, their visual appearance. And that is reflecting the organic and the mineral layers that are both being created in this plot. So, in conclusion, we can restore phosphorus-enriched areas of the Everglades. By using a combination of herbicides and fire, we can create and maintain openings they are more oxygenated, we potentially have fish with lower mercury concentrations, and we have a habitat that is accessible for useful and for wildlife. And if we can keep these open in the long term, perhaps we can continue to reduce our phosphorus concentrations in the soils and actually even reverse eutrophication. So you decide. Did we sell out? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>